zdolni sezon drugi. Witajcie w kontynuacji naszej serii, którą zaczęliśmy na początku pandemii, już ponad rok temu, dzieląc się z Wami ciekawymi inspiracjami, pomysłami, ludźmi z, ze świata muzyki liturgicznej, sztuki sakralnej, ze świata naszej fundacji i naszego środowiska. Minął rok, pandemia nie minęła, ale mamy nadzieję, że już powoli dochodzimy końca. Tematy dalej są ważne, dalej jest mnóstwo ciekawych inspiracji w tym naszym świecie formacji liturgicznej, odkrywania piękna wiary przez liturgię właśnie. I dzisiaj, w tym pierwszym odcinku nowego sezonu, który zresztą, jak ci z Was, którzy nas widzą na YouTube, mogą się zorientować, nagrywamy w nowym miejscu. Nagrywamy u naszych sąsiadów. Biuro naszej fundacji znajduje się tam, Stolarska 6 przez 30, a tu na poziomie ulicy w dość nowym lokalu o wdzięcznej nazwie Boho, którego właściciel bardzo nas gościnnie przyjął. Jeśli tylko pandemia pozwoli i drzwi się otworzą, to bardzo Was też tutaj zapraszamy. Będziemy w tym sezonie właśnie w takiej przestrzeni spotykać się i rozmawiać. Kto ze mną jest? Słuchajcie, zaraz przedstawię naszych gości i zrobię to w języku angielskim, bo jest to język, w którym obydwie panie komunikują się na co dzień. Ten odcinek będzie odcinkiem, opowieścią, świadectwem, pewną eksploracją drogi do wiary tych dwóch naszych e, pań zaproszonych. E, w Paschę, w Wielkanoc tego roku e, jedna z nich przyjęła chrzest, a druga była jej matką chrzestną i o tym trochę będzie. A teraz, proszę Państwa, przerzucam się na język angielski. E, na YouTubie oczywiście dostępne są napisy i tłumaczenie. Well, ladies, welcome to this vlog podcast. Uh, I just explained to our uh, listeners, our viewers, what we are doing here. And I told them that the major reason why you are here tonight is the baptism. Last Easter, yes. Sophia, you joined the family, so you're the baby. Yes, I am. <laughs> welcome home. Well, Thank you'll you. hear more about who she is. So uh, your name is Sophia, right? And you were just baptized. How? Last week, that's right. Well, I can tell, you know, there's this halo and uh, yeah, the glow. <laughs> well, Sydney, who is next to me. That is right. <laughs> well, uh, Sydney served this year as a catechist, so someone who participates in the formation process in this program that we call RCIA. Uh, so that's why she met Sophia and in that wonderful capacity and relationship of God parenting. Uh, just last Easter, you kind of completed your mission. But we'll talk about all that stuff and all that experience. So, Sophia and Sydney, welcome to Zdolni. <laughs> it's good to have you guys. So, where are you from? Sophia. Okay. Precisely from Tunis. More Oops. precisely from Carthage. Ooh, nice. Is it a big city? Um, I mean, it's the capital, but my area is quite small. Nice. So you are from Tunisia and uh, Sydney. What about you? I was born and raised in Oregon in the United States. And I moved to Krakow 10 years ago. So now this is home. So this is home. This is home. Fantastic. How is your Polish? Well, it's okay. <laughs> you said it's okay. <laughs> That's a very American thing I'm, to say. I'm well, bilingual, <laughs> yes, okay. Right? <laughs> I love it. Sofia, do you speak Polish? I mean, I'm taking classes, but I don't want to start talking, speaking Polish unless I can speak as good as you do, otherwise. I'm <laughs> and it's a very, very challenging language, yes. right? So, um, hey, I really want to ask you, Sofia, about your favorite experience with this program we call RCIA, which by the way, if someone doesn't know what RCIA stands for, well, it's Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults. So obviously you are not a baby, you're not an infant. Yes. <laughs> um, you're an adult who kind of discovered Christianity, right? Mm -hmm. So what's your favorite experience so far? Well, first favorite one is getting baptized, of course. <laughs> but before that, I would say joining this and like, getting to know Christianity from a deeper perspective or from a deeper level because although I, I knew I wanted to become Christian, I didn't know that much. 
So I love the fact that when you want to be Christian, you just don't go to church and they're like, okay, let's do it. So they teach you, they tell you things, and then you have to make the decision again. So I, this is my favorite like, part of it, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, you mentioned that uh, you, you wanted to become Christian. You made that decision a while ago. Yeah. What, what, what's, your, what's your story? Well, it's a long one. Well, I don't Love know. stories here. So the Go thing is, like, I was born in Tunisia, a country that where most people are Muslim, but we still have, like, pretty much every religion. However, the, I don't know, I just, like, from a very young age, like, even there, my favorite place was this, like, cathedral or this, like, St. Cyprianus's old church, like, I love to go there and sit there. And I was just feeling like I'm attracted to this. I don't know why. And I was, like, pretty, pretty young. I remember, for example, when I was a kid, I would watch the Mass from Vatican and the Italian channel and see the kids and think that maybe I am gonna go there one day and meet the Pope. I just don't know how it happened, but I always felt like it's kind of calling me and then I grew up I started researching I felt that the religion I was born into was not really compatible with my mindset with how I feel about life and so on and then and I how old were you at the time actually I wasn't that old I was 13 you're 13 yes wow and just researching world religions and saying yes. you know i don't feel like this one is compatible with my mindset at the age yes. of 13. okay just making sure that i heard you right yes it is, is true i was pretty young at the time and when i made the decision to become christian i was 16 because it took me like three years of reading all the books like i didn't just look at christianity i also read the quran few times I read the Bible, the Torah, I even looked into Hinduism and stuff like that. So I wanted it to be like a very rational decision. And I was 16 when I decided to do it. But in my country, you cannot change your religion if you're a minor. So when I went to church back then, there was this like brother who was very nice. He started some kind of initiation for me, but he told me that you cannot do it unless you're 18. And by the time I turned 18, I had to travel somewhere else. So that was not possible as well. And then just like time went by and it went forgotten and I even lost faith, I admit that. And then one day I was sitting and I just, it just popped in my head that I have to do it. So I Googled and then I found you and I wrote you an email, I didn't even know that it's the right place and then I get a reply back, I didn't even expect to get a response back but then you replied, you said okay, so now there's pandemic, blah 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 and next year you can join and here I am Wow I mean, meeting people like you has been, for me at least, you know one of the most amazing experiences in my, my priestly ministry well, so I kind of do this for, we can say for the living, right? Like, <laughs> this is my calling, this is my job, right? But Sydney, how, how did you end up taking part in this process? And like, eh, what do you think about it? Preparing well, people, or like welcoming people into the family? <laughs> yeah, that, it wasn't, I, 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 we talked about this in the beginning. I, um, you know, Einstein says, coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. And uh, when I moved back here, I was gone for a few years um, back to Oregon. And when I moved back, uh, one of the women from our church, from St. Giles, where I go to church um, in English, said, oh, you should really help with the RCIA. You'd be perfect. And I didn't have time. I'm a single mom. I have all these things going, and I don't have time. But then I think you mentioned it, as did another... Uh, Dominican who suggested that maybe I should help and and so it was playing on my mind and, and I really feel it's my obligation as a Christian to carry to share this message to share the good news to be able and available to welcome anyone who wants to know more about Christ and the joy that we have here so yeah, I'm so happy that you actually said yes to it <laughs> now you mentioned that you have a lot of obligations, a lot of duties, you know, you're a busy person. Well, what, what do you do? <laughs> uh, well, in, so for my, 
profession, I suppose. I am completing my doctorate in theology at the um, John Paul II Pontifical University here in Krakow. Um, and I'm a single mom, so I have a 15-year-old. That's, that's a responsibility. And then I spend about 50, 40 to 50 hours doing volunteer work. Um, so I'm very busy. Well, we could probably have a separate podcast just on the stuff that you do. <laughs> or like three separate episodes, right? Uh, but you mentioned theology, and, and this is something that I really want to dive into a little bit more. So being a lay theologian, being a woman in theology. Uh, so this is something I want to talk about more towards the end of our conversation. But now, well, you also mentioned that this was actually the first time for you to do RCIA. Um, so you've been studying theology, and now it kind of connected with like the real sort of like church community experience. Like you had the chance to take all the stuff that you know that you've read about and actually sort of like pour into the hearts and souls of those amazing people like Sophia. How did it feel? It was, um, it took a minute for me to get used to it because I lectured. <laughs> so right. That's my atmosphere, my academic lecturing atmosphere. Um, and it was difficult because it was online. Mm -hmm. And so I think, the experience would be different in person than what we have, so we could have more of a conversation. But um, after a while, you know, it, it was, it was, I felt a little one-sided at times because I didn't have the interaction, but seeing the results and having conversations <laughs> elsewhere, there's that part of, this part that you can't put into words really. Um, and so the experience as usual is far greater than what I, my expectations, or even, it goes beyond. Like we were talking about her baptism. There's the idea and the experience, but it's something you can't quite put into words. And that's my experience with discussing, you know, the faith. Yeah. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Especially with people who are just entering that world and there's that freshness and that curiosity. Well, this one is, exceptional when it comes to curiosity and questions. Um, well, so let's talk about the community since, Sophia, you're just kind of experiencing for the first time what it means to be in the church, not just the church building, but, you know, in this living body of Christ. And, well, Sydney, you've seen the church back in the U.S. and you've been here for over a decade now, so you know Poland pretty well. Um, Let's talk about that kind of, you know, the Catholic life, perhaps here in Poland, since, you know, this is the place where we are now uh, trying to grow in our relationship with Christ, but then perhaps you can compare that with, with other places. So let's begin with you, Sophia. What's your sort of experience with the Catholic Church in this country? How do you... I don't know. I mean, I've it? been Catholic for a week only. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you've seen Catholics around you. And yes. You've seen, you know... um, I actually like it and I find it very cute, to be honest. And I love the fact that... I mean, I'm very happy that I was baptized here in Poland and not somewhere else. Uh, I mean, if I had to pick, I would have picked Italy maybe again because it's like very rooted <laughs> in their traditions and identity. And I feel that Poland has the same thing. So I'm, I'm very happy it was done here because I feel that Christianity to this country is crucial because it's like part of the country's history, basically. And although, of course, I know that nowadays things are changing and people are going other ways, but still, it's going to remain undeniable, I think so. So I'm, I'm very happy, honestly. Like, I just find it very nice. I think that people are really nice. Um, I, I didn't have any conversations about my new faith with like Polish people so far, but I feel that they would like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably you should verify that. Yeah, we <laughs> Let's hope the pandemic, you know, ends soon and then you'll have a chance, um, well, to be more, you know, um, in person uh, in, in the Polish, like, Catholic world. Um, See, I wonder, so you said you've, you haven't had that many conversations about Catholicism with the 
Polish people so far. Do you work with some Poles in your professional life? I do, but I keep things private, right. so I don't tell people anything, and yeah, it just didn't happen. And it's probably similar for them, right? So it's yes. not a thing you'll discuss these no. days. Plus mm -hmm. we're working from home, so we just like right. write to each other on Slack, just work-related stuff. So we don't even have time to like catch up, have this little chit-chat anymore, because everything is from home, so yeah. Well, let's hope pretty soon we'll, we're back to that kind of Hopefully. church life. Well, Sydney, well, you, you've seen Polish parishes Polish churches before the pandemic, <laughs> coming from the US, is there something that, I don't know, strikes you as kind of different, Polish church, the vibe? <laughs> so this is, I mean, actually, I think, I don't know if people find this funny, but it was shocking for me, the first mass that I came to here in Krakow, we went to Mariacki because right. we were jet lagged and we were up early and, you know, I found it on my app Where's the next closest mass? And we went to Mariatsky and I was with my friend who spent a lot of time in Mexico. Um, she came with me when we moved here and my five-year-old daughter at the time. And when it was time for communion in America, in communion, uh, each row, the first row, you start with the first row and very orderly, everyone goes. And here it's just like a free for all. And we were like, oh my gosh, what's happening? You know, it's, it's like, free as well. <laughs> it's like, go, go now before they run out. And it was, it was shocking. So that was, that was something that took me some time to get used to. But um, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of cultural differences between America and Poland as far as um, the community, um, how things are done. You know, when we stand up, when we kneel, there's some, I mean, there's just some differences. But, um, you know, I think the community aspect is the same as in America. I, I don't feel, so in America, you have a parish, you go to the parish, everybody meets there, you say hi, maybe you have coffee and donuts afterwards, and then you all go home. Mm -hmm. And that's my experience here as well. We've tried to form, and over the last 10 years, a nice community has formed over at St. Giles. Um, but with the pandemic... It's not really it, your typical no, parish, right? No, it's not. And, uh, I, I, but this is here in Krakow. I hear outside of Krakow we have different experiences. But, um, you know, maybe because the city has 270,000 students that come and go, and all the tourists that come and go, that you don't have quite the parish feeling like you would somewhere else. Well, that's my dream, you know, to have parishes where people actually get to know each other. They recognize, you know, their fellow parishioners. They know their stories. They know what they're going through, more or less. So, like, there's this sort of neighborly help attitude, you know, like, hey, I, I heard you're sick, you know, can I do anything for you, right? Which is like this early Christianity that you read about in the Acts of the Apostles and you see that in smaller communities, I think here in Poland and perhaps in the US, because we have so many Catholics and parishes are pretty big, you know, it's hard to get that sort of, you know, intimacy with, with people, uh, getting to know them on a more personal basis, right? Um, now, I'm glad that, you know, both of you actually have a positive experience and if you like, okay, it may be weird with like kneeling and standing up and all the kind of, you know, the, what we call the blesser size, you know, blessed exercise. Uh, but let's perhaps talk a little bit about um, you guys being Catholic women in the church. Well, Sophia has been a Catholic lady for about a week, a week now. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure... Even you, being a newbie, I'm sure you've asked yourself, like, so what's my place in this community? What am I supposed to do? Can I help with some way? Can I be, a, you know, a member of something, a leader of something? And well, it's gonna be totally different, I guess, with you, Sydney, since you know you've been doing some like intense Catholic stuff for four years. So, is there, in your experience, uh, is there room for women in the leadership um so i think that's a deeper question that you know than a five minute answer um 
I think I feel more, uh, and I think people are shocked by this. I have had a phenomenal experience as a woman in the church in Krakow. Phenomenal. The interactions that I've had with the priests, um, the openness, the enthusiasm, the encouragement for me to um, go further. I mean, really, I didn't plan on doing a doctorate when I came here. And, you know, I met someone who knew someone who knew another guy who just happened to be this priest at this university. And, and from, I just got swept up and carried by all these um, men in the church who have carried me and, and, and brought me to the place where I am now. Um, it's been a phenomenal experience, much more so than I had in the U.S. when I studied at a seminary as the only lay woman there, it was a very different atmosphere. Um, very, I felt very separated. I felt very other than. I felt like, and there were probably some people who thought I didn't belong there, um, who questioned my motivation for being there. And so here in Poland, I've, I really feel welcome and a part of, and I'm not looking to become like, you know, a, I mean, I don't know what God wants for me. I'm just studying and I like it and I show up when I'm supposed to and who knows what's next. But um, really the attitude here, I think it's shocking for some people to hear, but my personal attitude has been nothing but wonderful. I had no, I've, I've met one, <laughs> one priest who <laughs> didn't like me very much, but, but, uh, but that was it. You know, and um, maybe it was just a personality thing. So. Well, I mean, it's great to hear because most people would say either, you know, as a first hand experience or just kind of, you know, describing the whole phenomenon. Most people would say that it's just really difficult to be a kind of a strong, active, creative, you know, leader type woman in the church that, you know, often the structure is so male driven and you know yeah it's a big conversation you're right we could have a different podcast just on that but i i'm glad that you know your experience here in krakow is is different that when you show up and when you kind of display that you know passion for the faith there's some people who say hey you know what hey you should do something about it go this way go get your doctorate learn more you know share the joy of the faith that that's awesome well, the, the models of the church are changing. In the 70s, we came out with the different models of the church, and I think we're trying to move back towards a church of service instead of a, we're up here and all you people down there, we have to hurt, help. Um, but the other thing is, you know, I think anyone who approaches Christianity or the church in any way that is rooted in prayer, rooted in really found the foundation uh, as the as the desert fathers say, you know, if to be a theologian, you must pray truly. And if you pray truly, you will be a theologian. And all that means is that if I'm connected with Christ, if I'm connected with God in, in all of my being, you know, um, then he will carry me to where I need to be. There's no struggle. There's no fight. Um, I think of, you know, Catherine of Siena you know, uh, or Teresa of Avila. They didn't, you know, they weren't out to be women in the church. They weren't out to plant their flag and make a point. They were just out to do God's, God's will and to serve as they can. And I think when we approach in an attitude of service, if God wants me to sweep the floor and that's what he wants me to do, then, you know, that's what I do. And if he wants me to stand up at a conference and, you know, write something, you know, Augustine says, you know, if it's your will, God, I will produce this book, right? I will write this thesis. I will write this treatise. And if we approach it in that way, then it doesn't matter what anybody around us does or says. God's going to, like, be on our side to get us where he wants us to be. So. Wow. I, th that's a perfect closing line. <laughs> something to chew upon, something that can still resonate in us. Um, well, Sophia, I guess you have a big sort of, you know, um, how to say it? Like the, 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 the bar is raised really high. That's your godmother. So 
<laughs> She's supposed to be the example. <laughs> she is. Be just like her. Now be yourself. Be yourself, of course. So, um, I guess I'm, I'm just speechless. <laughs> this is not good for a podcast. But, ladies, thank you for sharing a tiny bit of your journey with us. This podcast is just like a little glance, and we wish we could go deeper, and perhaps one day we will. So, your story as a Christian Catholic has just begun. Keep writing it, Sophia. Thank you. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you, and Sydney, thank you for that amazing example that you are. And uh, I witnessed that as a RCIA coordinator this year. This is just an amazing service. So, I hope you continue doing this. If that's God's will, right? It's God's will. <laughs> I'm willing. Amen. Well, ladies, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, switch back to Polish. Dziękujemy, że byli Państwo z nami. Zachęcamy do oglądania kolejnych odcinków. Będzie ich jeszcze kilka, co dwa tygodnie tej wiosny, zimy. Pogoda wskazuje na zimę, ale wiemy, że to jest wiosna. Zapraszamy Was do kolejnych odcinków. Wielkie dzięki gospodarzowi tego miejsca, czyli naszemu sąsiadowi Jankowi, który na Stolarskiej 6 właśnie ten piękny lokal o nazwie Boho prowadzi. Zapraszamy Was do tego, żeby nas polubić. To znaczy podnieście łapkę na YouTubie albo w inny sposób wyraźcie entuzjazm, że chcecie więcej zdolnych i więcej produktów naszej fundacji, produkcji, projektów. Poczytajcie o tym więcej. Zapraszamy na naszą stronę, na której też możecie znaleźć sposoby, żeby nas wesprzeć, bo bez Waszej pomocy będzie bardzo e, trudno, przynajmniej trudniej e, uzyskać takie no, niezwykłe efekty, jak na przykład nasz dzisiejszy podcast. Wszystkiego dobrego życzymy Wam i do usłyszenia, zobaczenia za dwa tygodnie.